The backbone of Toronto's transit system is the subway, but just how much of it is actually sub? Sub means under, beneath, below, subterranean. But like the subway systems in many cities, Toronto's is not entirely underground. So just how sub is it? Well, to figure out how much is underground, we're going to need some ground rules. See what I did there? And it's my video, so I make the rules. We are only considering the system as it exists today. Past or future parts of the system don't count. Only real subways count, so even if it hadn't just closed, Line 3 Scarborough RT would not have counted. Only sections of the system that are in ordinary use carrying passengers count. Things like yards, interchanges between lines, or tail tracks beyond the last station on a line don't count. If a section of station or track is at or above ground level, even if it's enclosed in a concrete box, it doesn't count as underground. The TTC publishes the total line length, so I'm using those, but I don't have access to engineering diagrams showing what's above or below ground. For that, I'm doing what I can using Google Earth's ruler tool, so my numbers are best guesses, but I think I can get within a percent or two. When Toronto's first subway line opened, it ran from Union Station up to Eglinton Avenue. The section from Union to just north of Bloor Station was all underground, then it emerged on the surface to just south of Summerhill Station, which brings us here, the Summerhill Avenue Bridge. This bridge made an appearance in my previous video on Toronto's Lost Rivers. I'll put a magic link up here, and I'll put a link down in the description so you can find it when you finish watching this video. This bridge crosses over the subway tracks. Now, on either side of the bridge, it just looks like ground level is here. But when this section opened, the subway ran in the open with embankments on either side. Over the years, all of this section from Summerhill up to St. Clair, as well as a small section south of Summerhill, has been covered. But if you look out the train windows as you go through here, you'll see it doesn't look like tunnel, because it isn't. The surface here is just a thin layer held up by pillars. To me, that's not underground. And remember, my video, my rules. The real surface here is down where the tracks run. Now, going back to the original subway line, just north of St. Clair, it emerges to the surface again, approaching Davisville subway yards, and then it's on the surface until just south of Eglinton, which is the last stop on the original subway line. That original line has been extended a number of times over the years, on both ends of the line, to form today's Line 1, or Young University Spadina Line. To the north of the original line along Young, it's easy. It's all underground. The western section is all underground from Union all the way up to Eglinton West, where, as you can see in this video, it emerges at the surface. Keep an eye on the driver coming towards us for a friendly wave just before going out of sight. From here, it runs north on the surface to the north end of the Wilson subway yard and then heads underground again for the rest of its route. So, let's get out that ruler. On the original part of the line, I measure the surface section around Rosedale at 0.84 km, the section north of Summerhill at 0.47 km, and the section around Davisville at 1.29 km. On the Spadina side, I get 5.27 km in the open. That leaves 30.52 out of 38.39 km below ground, or 79% of Line 1 Young University Spadina. Toronto's second subway line, the Bloor-Danforth Line, now known as Line 2, opened in 1966. Well, the first part of it did, from Keel to Woodbine. The eastern side of that is all below ground except for the bridges over the Don River and Rosedale Ravine. Those bridges are in one of my previous videos. There's a link on screen, and I'll put it in the description too. To the west, it's underground to a bit west of Dundas West, and then above ground to Keel Station, which is elevated. This line has also been extended in bits and pieces over the years. The western part goes back and forth between above and below ground a number of times. Immediately west of Keele, it goes back underground, re-emerging briefly between High Park and Runnymede. 
It's underground again until it emerges west of Jane to cross the Humber River on its approach to Old Mill Station. Old Mill was always a favorite of mine when I was a kid, since one end of the station is on a bridge and has big windows. The line continues underground until it reaches a surface section between Royal York and Islington to cross Mimico Creek. It goes back underground just before Islington at this unusual triple portal, thanks to a center track. West of Islington, it's underground for a little way and then back on the surface to the end of the line at Kipling. Kipling was designed with a roughed-in third platform that you can see here on the upper level opposite the bus base, with the idea of connecting the subway to something similar to the Scarborough RT. That never ended up happening. The eastern part of the extension is much simpler. It's underground to just before Victoria Park, and then above ground until a bit north of Warden, where it goes back underground for the rest of its route to Kennedy. From east to west, I measured the above ground sections as follows. From Warden to Victoria Park, 2.79 kilometers. Prince Edward Viaduct, 0.48 kilometers. Rosedale Valley Bridge, 0.17 kilometers. From Dundas West through Keel, 0.51 kilometers. Between High Park and Runnymede, 0.26 kilometers. Around Old Mill, 0.28 kilometers. West of Royal York, 0.36 kilometers. West of Islington, 1.12 kilometers. That leaves 20.26 out of 26.23 kilometers below ground, or 77% of Line 2 Bloor Danforth. Line 4 Shepherd is the newest and shortest of Toronto subway lines, and the easiest one to calculate for this video. Now, if you're one of the few people who use this line, you might have looked out the train window and thought the whole thing's underground, but it isn't. In fact, I'm standing on top of Line 4 right now. This bridge, just east of Leslie, carries Line 4 over the east branch of the Don River. And this is a pretty special bridge. To account for the possibility of events such as Hurricane Hazel, this bridge normally has about three meters clearance from the river below, but it's designed to withstand being completely submerged. The entire bridge is watertight, and it's designed to withstand all of the stress that that much water would put on it. Now, as for distance, I didn't have to calculate that one because I found an article in an engineering journal about this bridge from the time when it was constructed. It's 60 meters long. So the entire line is 5.47 kilometers, which leaves 5.41 kilometers below ground, or 99%. Let's go over the figures. For line one, the total length is 38.39 kilometers, underground is 30.52 kilometers, which works out to 79%. For line 2, the total length is 26.23 kilometers, with 20.26 kilometers underground, for a percentage of 77%. And for line 4, we have a total length of 5.47 kilometers, with 5.41 kilometers underground, which works out to 99%. <laughs> so, in total, the Toronto subway system is 70.09 kilometers long, of which 56.19 kilometers is underground. That works out to 80%. So I'd say the system is predominantly sub. But for just before I go, I wanted to mention one of my favorite YouTubers, Jeff Marshall, did a similar sort of video about three years ago about the London Underground, although he was counting how many stations were underground, so it's not directly comparable. But it's kind of interesting. I'll put a link down in the description so you can find it. And with that, we're done. I hope you enjoyed this Nerdfest. If you did, you know what to do. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs>